This week, we pay a virtual visit to Sheffield Dockfest to discuss their fabulous female-led documentaries. Here's critic Simran Hans on one of her favourites. She's got her chicken, she's got her supplement, she's got her lip ring, she's got a polyamorous relationship, which uh, the parents who are very Jewish by their own admission find quite difficult. And so that's one of the, the things they have to navigate. I also talked to Anam Abbas about filming female activists in Pakistan and the director of Docfest herself, Cynthia Gill. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello, I'm your host, Anna Smith, and this episode is in partnership with Sheffield Dockfest, which is happening right now, both in cinemas and online. It runs till the 13th of June 2021. My first guest is festival director Cynthia Gill. Well, Cynthia, welcome to Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very pleased to have you with us now. Tell us about Sheffield Dockfest this year. What's going on? So we're in Sheffield with amazing, exciting program of films, of art exhibitions, talks, workshops, but also online. So everyone can just go to our websites and explore the program, enter our platforms. We'll be having not just pre-recorded uh, Q&As and talks online, but also live streamed from Sheffield. And we will have five films, five incredible films being shown across the UK. So in 16 venues in the UK. Uh, and so it's kind of Sheffield going everywhere. What were the challenges of planning the festival in this kind of hybrid way in this very unusual year? Basically, we had to program to plan two festivals, right? Because it's physical and online. It's like doing two festivals. But we really try to get the best of the online, what it could give us, you know, what it could add to the festival. And actually, it's amazing because we could have guests from across the world, regardless of the of the pandemic. And we even have a radio. So it's a, an online radio during the Festival for the Arts program. So we really managed to put together with a lot of work and like a, it was a huge learning curve for our team, but we managed to actually put together a festival that everyone will feel somehow uh, part of. We're talking about some of our highlights of the festival in this episode, but from your perspective, particularly in terms of documentaries that are either by women or about women, what are the highlights our listeners might particularly enjoy? Oh my God, there are so many amazing films by and about women. So start with international competition. We have This Thing Done by Anam Abbas uh, from Pakistan, which is an amazing film about a group of feminist girls fighting for equality and civil rights in Pakistan against the patriarchal, very oppressive environment. Yeah, look at the amount of commandos, man. Look at the fucking amount of commandos. So it's a good event, Pakistan, no, it's a good event. We have a wonderful film also from the international competition, Charm Circle, by a young uh, American filmmaker, Nira Burstein, about her family. And it's a beautiful, compelling film. We have a screening across the UK. We have My Name is Polly Murray by uh, Julie Cohen and Betsy West, who have done RBG before. My name is Polly Murray, and my field of concentration has been human rights. 
My whole personal history has been a struggle to meet standards of excellence in a society which has been dominated by the ideas that blacks were inherently inferior to whites and women were inherently inferior to men. It's an incredible film about Polly Murray, who maybe some people wouldn't know about because it's a story that should be much more known. But uh, Polly Murray was a pioneer on women's civil rights, on LGBTQ Q people, on, on Black people's civil rights. She was a lawyer and a poet and a priest. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing film. Or also screening across the UK, we have Lift Like, Lift like a Girl, which is a film about a girl who is doing lift, uh, weightlifting in Egypt. So, yeah, again, uh, kind of pioneer. <laughs> I love the fact that I feel like we're seeing more documentaries now finally trying to rewrite the wrongs of the way that history has been told in the past. So talking more about her story and about women like Paulie Murray that you mentioned, do you think that that is changing? Have you seen that change in recent years, you know, more documentaries about forgotten women? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's to do with the fact that more women are doing film and documentaries but also with the fact that, uh, yeah, like uh, funders and everyone is kind of awakening for the fact that it was not possible to go on like that, right? We needed to change things. When we, today, it's not just seeing women doing films about women, but also seeing women doing films about the world, right? And, and, and having this perspective from people that usually would not be able to to come across right and 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 to actually have a voice about the world and that's amazing and many times about some really pretty hard subjects and and they are there but at the same time i mean we have amazing women that have been there already for a long time like lydia lunch right we have lydia lunch this year in the festival and lydia lunch for example is a, is an inspiration for for so many of us right who this rebellious um, need to, to break boundaries. You touched on this there, but I'm interested to explore this more. Do you think women have a different approach when making documentaries in particular? Do you notice a gender gaze? And perhaps could you even tell when watching a documentary before you know who the director is, can you tell that it's a woman? It's a very tricky question. <laughs> I think uh, if we can talk about female gays, it's about power relations. You know, there's a beautiful text from Portugal about uh, that. It was a text written, written during dictatorship by three women, and they were accused of pornography for writing that text. And it's a text where they say, they talk to a man and they say, we are seeing you, but you are not seeing us. And therefore we know. And so this traditional historical position of not being in the power center made women and other people, not just women, LGBTQ, uh, minorities, you know, racialized people, being in a position where they had to observe a lot and they had to understand the world that it was deeply complicated and many times deeply violent. And that gave them, I believe, an understanding and a specific sensitivity for certain things that is harder to get when you are in the center of power, right? When you can do virtually anything. And so I would say that if there is a female gaze, it has to do with that, you know, with, with this development of observation and, and strategies to exist within a, a, con a context where you're not allowed to talk. That is very well put. I'm also interested to know in your work, have you noticed changes in the way that documentaries are made in general? Because it feels like perhaps there are some trends or, you know, sort of themes emerging in, in recent years. What's your take on that? It's very interesting. It changes according to different parts of the world. So, for example, I see a lot of films from Latin America 
dealing with very dark moments from the past. So, for example, we have a film from Guatemala by an incredibly brave filmmaker called The Silence of the Mole, where she is talking about the crimes from during Guatemalan uh, uh, oppressive regime. And it's an amazing investigation. So that is coming a lot. And also, you know, films about justice, not just historical justice, like My Name is Polly Murray, but also, you know, calling out for uh, a fairer society. So questions like Black Lives Matter, obviously, is not the cause, it's the symptom, right? So that question exists and has existed, but exists even more now uh, within films. Um, class equality. So I think that the fact that film is becoming an art, and especially documentary, is an art that is becoming more and more democratic in terms of the access to do it, makes an explosion of topics and forms. I've certainly noticed that a lot of my friends are getting more into documentaries actually because they've got access to streaming services and they're experimenting more and they think, hey, I'm just going to give this a whirl. Do you think that actually things like that are helping drive audiences into cinemas to watch documentaries at events like Sheffield DocFest? I do, I do. I am not a Puritan against uh, uh, streaming services. I think it is important for people to understand the difference between watching a film on a television or a computer and watching it in the cinema with other human beings. But I do believe that streaming services have put documentary as a form of art, recognized as a form of art and a form of of storytelling that has the same dignity as any other form. And that is very important. I think the fact that you have at the same time so many important documentaries being streamed. And at the same time, you have documentaries winning main awards in big film festivals like Venice. Tells a lot. Are you hopeful about the future of progress um, in terms of documentaries? Let's let's talk specifically from a feminist perspective about more female filmmakers, more stories about women. Obviously, we're seeing that happening now, but I, I feel like we've still got a way to go until we've got parity? I'm hopeful because, again, as I said in the beginning, I think that there is a a patrimony of resistance that will always be there. (laughs) So no one will stop us. Um, But that is hopeful. And I'm sure we will get there. But I think there's a lot to do still, you know, like it's not just about how many women, but it's also about what is the, the the room for freedom in storytelling from these women? Because it's not the same thing, right? It's, it's not the same thing if you come from... If you're a woman coming from Guatemala, for example, and you want to tell a story that deals with such a hard issue, you know, it's such a strong barrier. And so I think that there is a lot, you know, in the past 20 years where I have worked, I've seen massive changes right? When I started my career, I could never dream I would be a festival director. Never. It would be impossible. But I think that there's needs not just for more women working, but also to recognize the need for them to do as they want to do and to explore the things that they need to explore. Is there anything else about Sheffield that you'd like to leave our listeners with this year? I would like to say that I know it's the end of a lockdown, I know things are opening up. Everything is a little bit confusing. Even us, you know, like we're like, oh my God, this is happening. But I want to say that we have lived such a long time isolated and we need to come together critically. We need to think together and to kind of gather our strength. And Sheffield Dog Fest is trying to celebrate that, really. And, and, and we really want to feel that our audience comes to us and tell us what they thought, you know? This was great, this was not great, and this is why, you know? Just come to us and, and, and share with us this enthusiasm and also this possibility of traveling across the globe and, and let us know what this makes to you and what is... What is film for you now? So, yeah, the best thing you can do to a programmer or a person who makes a film festival is 
Tell them what you thought. Feedback. I say the same about the podcast as well. We love hearing from listeners. It's so important. And that's how we all grow. Um, but congratulations again on everything you do. Absolutely terrific festival. We're so pleased to be supporting it. And we'll put everything in the show notes so people can find out how to watch the films this year. Thank you so much for joining Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank you. That was Cynthia Gill. Next up, the critic Simran Hans joins me to review three festival films. Welcome back to Girls on Film. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you back. And also to talk about Sheffield Docfest. Are you a fan of documentaries in general? Yes, I'm a fan of documentaries, but I'm also a huge fan of, of Sheffield Docfest, the film festival itself. I think I like to credit it as where I began my film career. I was 21 years old, fresh out of university, and I was on their youth jury. And that was really my first introduction into the world of film festivals. And it just absolutely blew my mind. I couldn't believe that there were this many interesting people, this many interesting films, all kind of milling about in the same space. So I feel very nostalgic for that time. And I'm I'm sad not to be in Sheffield and drinking a pint in the Rutland Arms this year. Yes, that's what I was hoping we would be doing, but hopefully next year. But yeah, it's nice to be connecting virtually at least this time. Um, So yeah, we've established you're a fan of documentaries and Sheffield, as are we. And we've picked a couple of documentaries which I think are kind of linked in some ways, actually. It'd be really interesting to talk about. The first one is Charm Circle, which is a portrait of an eccentric New York family. After uncovering a treasure trove of home videos, filmmaker Naira Bernstein returns to her childhood home to explore whether she and her two sisters can reconnect with her parents. Now, that's the synopsis, but as we know from having watched it, Simran, there's a lot more to this film. What did you make of it? Well, what I like about this film and and what I like about this kind of documentary is that it feels very personal. I think sometimes when we think about documentary, we think of them as message films or sort of vehicles for, I don't know, like some sort of political lesson or kind of teaching that that we want to learn. And this is a super personal, really interesting portrait. It's a kind of fly on the wall type situation. And it's all about Nira's family. So you've got her parents, Udi and Raya, and the two sisters, Judy and Adina. And they are all what you might describe as characters. They're based in Queens, New York. They live in this sort of crumbling house that is full of stuff, full of memories, full of ephemera. And um, they kind of talk about the ways in which their relationships have broken down over the years. But it's very funny and it's very touching as well. I think um, one of the big points of tension in the family is between the younger sister, Adina, who has escaped. She's gone all the way across the country to Olympia, Washington on the West Coast. And she's maybe what you would expect of somebody who's moved to Olympia. You know, we've all seen Portlandia. She's got a chicken. She's got a supplement. She's got a lip ring. She's got a polyamorous relationship, which uh, the parents who are very Jewish by their own admission find quite difficult. And so that's one of the, the things they have to navigate. Charm Circle is the most desirable place to live in Kew Garden Hills. The post office is Flushing, New York, 11367. And beautiful trees and bushes, and we have hydrangeas and uh, tea roses that are not flowering now because we killed them. It is a fascinating portrait, isn't it? These are the kind of people that I just felt I could have spent a lot of time with. And... There is laughter, but it's very affectionate because you're obviously seeing it through the daughter's eyes, aren't you? And you can see how much love there is in this film and how much concern for the difficult times that they've had. And I like the way she didn't actually shy away from asking some really tough questions of both of her parents. Were there any moments that really resonated with you like that? Yeah, um, they talk about Judy, who I believe is the sister, uh, one of her sisters. They talk about her mental health issues and sort of, her going to college and having all of these ambitions and, you know, the difficulties that arose both in terms of her journey, but also for the parenting as well. And um, I I found that like quite tough to watch in parts. There's this moment where she's sort of singing to herself and it's cut with footage, like home videos of, of her. And she's sort of not always the the main focus of those videos. She's kind of lingering in the background and she's sort of slightly haunted. And you get a real sense of what it must have been like and how lonely it must have been to be sort of going through 
these episodes and some struggles when she was growing up. It is poignant, but it is also funny. And I just think if you feel like you're walking into a house and that's a good documentary, but when you enter a house like this and you see the way other people live, I always find it fascinating and also reassuring when they live in a complete and utter mess. Um, <laughs> and, and also it's something quite voyeuristic about sort of seeing how they live and the, and the details of their lives and what they eat or what they don't eat. I felt that this inhabited a world not unlike the classic Grey Gardens. I don't know if you're a fan of that one. The relatives didn't know that they were dealing with a staunch character. And another thing, Mrs. Beale wasn't taken care of sexually. Now I'll have to get drunk. I'll have to start drinking. I can't take it. And you can always take off the skirt and use it as a cape. So I think this is the best costume for the day. I agree, Grey Gardens definitely felt like a reference point for me as well in the way that both of those documentaries take these outsiders in society and kind of help us to understand them a little bit more. And I think, you know, it's worth saying that with Charm Circle, Charm Circle refers to the neighbourhood um, and the, the sort of street where they live. They do kind of talk about how this hoarders-like situation that they've ended up in is a result of the fact that they are really struggling to get by. They're very financially precarious. Work has been hard to maintain. They're living paycheck to paycheck. I think it's interesting to sort of think about that in terms of the daughter filming it and sort of her impulse to kind of document what's going on and to sort of do it in this non-judgmental way, but also the sort of pull to intervene and how there's like a tension there between you know, how she can help or how she might navigate that while also presenting it um, as truthfully as it is. I, I think that's really interesting. I really enjoy Charm Circle and I would recommend it. I think you're veering in the same direction? Yes, I think so. Excellent. So let's move on to the next one, which is also a film kind of about intimate portrait of a family, but a very different family. It's called If God Were a Woman. It's by Angelica Herrera from Colombia. And this is about Laura, who was born a boy and started her transition three years ago. Laura now faces adolescence and with it a series of changes that will mean a new chapter for her and her family. What did you make of this one? I think these really delicate stories of childhood and coming of age from a, a trans perspective are rare and they're kind of not becoming more mainstream. That's the perhaps like not the right way of phrasing it, but we're seeing more of them. And I think it's really nice to be able to revisit these classic themes of what does it mean to be a woman and to kind of come of age and step into your womanhood, but from this slightly different perspective. They're based in Valencia in Spain, and so it's so tied up with sort of Catholic culture as well and very kind of Catholic understandings of femininity. And so a lot of the plot kind of centres around Laura's first communion and sort of getting her dress fitted and, you know, what all of those gender roles are. And I think it's really sort of beautiful and touching to kind of see her understand what it might be to kind of move into the next stage of womanhood. Well, it's such a fascinating perspective, isn't it? The idea of a child who has been treated a certain way because they were initially raised as a boy, but then having their eyes open to what is expected, rightly or wrongly, of a girl in that very specific society, you say, in that very religious society. And I did find that really, really interesting. And also, um, what did you think of the, the choice to focus on things like bleaching the hair on her legs? I was just going to mention that moment because as a dark-haired woman myself, it felt very, um, very resonant. So there's this really kind of quite touching scene of her having her mum bleaching her leg hair in the bath. And she's like, mom, it burns. It's like, come and get me, like, come and sort me out. And then after she's like, oh, I don't think it worked. And her mum was like, no, like, they're going to be blonde. Like, this is how it is. And it's just that kind of mind exploding moment of realising that oh my God, my body's changing, compounded with the complexity of her sort of gender being kind of changing as well and, and that not being fixed. I, I thought that moment was really, really touching and really funny. I thought also the filmmaker found some lovely moments of quiet just observing the parents' faces, which I found really quite moving at times because you could see when they were feeling very sad or very troubled and 
I yeah, I just thought there were some lovely moments. Would you agree? Yeah, and I I also think that it was. I, I really think the title is uh, really cheeky and really funny. So <laughs> one of the early scenes of the film, you see Laura at the park with her mum, and her mum is sort of like go and play with everybody else, and she's freaking out because obviously you know has experienced bullying and you know has been scrutinised by her classmates and doesn't want to go anywhere near this pack of teenage boys who are all kind of very macho. And they're rapping, it's sort of they're like rapping on the street and it's this big scene in the park and she's wearing an Ariana Grande t-shirt and she says, Ari doesn't like rap. And the film is called If God is a Woman, which is the name of an Ariana Grande um, song, which I thought was just like a really sweet tie-in as well. And it's a really intriguing title as well. I think it's quite smart because it pulls you in. I enjoy this one in a completely different way, but I um, agree that, yeah, well worth a watch. Now, you picked out a short film that you wanted to mention. What's what's that all about? I did. So it's playing in the festival's um, Rebellion Strand. Um, and I also think it's playing in front of a film called Monopoly of Violence as well as a sort of pairing and it's called They Won't Call It Murder. It's a short film, it's directed by Ingrid Raphael and Melissa Gira Grant. It's set in Columbus, Ohio, and it's about five women who have each lost a loved one through the result of police brutality, which is obviously something that we've been talking about with increasing passion in the last year, particularly given that it's sort of now a year since the death of, of George Floyd. And it's really interesting that in this film, which kind of links these four separate incidents, each time the police officer was in plain clothes. And so I think that's a really kind of important thing to to highlight and an important, interesting thing that the film does in the way it sort of unpacks how there's an expectation of trust and of safety with the people who might be patrolling your neighbourhood and actually those are the people who are the most dangerous of all. It's really heartbreaking to kind of see these women speaking about who they've lost, particularly affecting is is the mother and the grandmother of a 13-year-old who did not fit the profile of a killer um, and was, was shot by a policeman. But I also think that it feels really vital to be giving these women space to sort of speak their truth and to disseminate their their message far and wide. Um, it was filmed before the pandemic, but after all of the Black Lives Matter protests erupted last summer, the filmmakers went back to Columbus to sort of see what was happening on the streets and, and to show their support. And I think there's one sort of image that has really stayed with me, and it's it's the opening where you have the voiceover of, I believe it's one of the mothers, and she is talking about a left-handed shooter And you immediately think she's talking about somebody with a gun. And then you see an image of a basketball hoop and you realise she's talking about a a boy who played basketball. And it really kind of is clever in the way it challenges the assumptions that you might make about these people. He's right-handed, but he was a left-hand shooter. It was the funniest thing because he could play with both hands, but you would never be expecting that shot from the left. And he made his brother as good as his brother ended up being. He learned how to shoot from the outside. So we always give up credit, like, yeah, you're a three-point shooter because your brother. <laughs> Thank you for that recommendation. This brings me actually to talking a little bit more generally to wrap up about documentaries and the future of documentaries because it feels like there's a lot of exciting opportunities in documentary making now. Hopefully more women are being given a platform and opportunity and what better way to communicate than than through film. How do you feel about the future of documentary making and do you think the kind of the style is in some way shifting? Do you think you know people are being a bit more playful and experimental with documentaries these days? I think if you, you look in the right places, then yeah, definitely documentary is where loads of innovation is happening. Some female documentary filmmakers that I think are some of the best filmmakers working today full stop. Kristen Johnson, who's camera person, I think is just one of the best films I've seen in the last... 10 years, probably ever. I I just think it's incredible. She's doing brilliant work. Brett Story, 
Uh, he made a film called The Hottest August a couple of years ago. I think she is so talented. She wrote an essay in World Records Journal about the sort of future of documentary and the, the threats to it and the way we kind of expect documentaries to sort of mimic narrative film and the ways in which she and other filmmakers are trying to challenge that. It's really interesting, worth checking out. And of course, the Queen, Garrett Bradley, whose film Time um, was nominated for an Oscar and is just one of my favourite things I've seen in a really long time. I think these kind of thinkers and practitioners are definitely paving the way. Totally agree. Now, Simran, if anyone wants to find out more about your work or to see what you're up to, where can they go? Probably best place to go is to follow me on Twitter at heavier underscore things or check out my page over on The Guardian, um, which is, well, if you Google Simran Hands plus Guardian, that's where you'll find me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining Girls on Film. We love having you on and um, do come back again soon. Thanks, Anna. Thanks to Simran Hans. My final guest is Anam Abbas. Her film This Stained Dawn is showing at Sheffield Dog Fest at the moment. This Stained Dawn tells the story of a feminist movement in Pakistan by following the organisers of a women's march. Anam, welcome to Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you with us. Congratulations on This Stained Dawn, which I found an incredibly powerful documentary. Um, something I think we can all relate to at the moment after protests in this country as well. Uh, before we talk about the doc, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your journey to filmmaking? I'm, I'm glad you connected to the film and, and uh, that was my intention. And I grew up in Pakistan. I studied film in Canada. I've been working in Pakistan uh, since about 2012 and film. Found when I was younger that there was not a lot of documentary coming out of the country and I sorely wanted to see myself represented on screen. I work as a producer and director across fiction and documentary. Um, and I also am one of the founders of the Documentary Association of Pakistan. Uh, and that through that organization, we're trying to develop more documentary filmmakers from the country because we find the medium to be very valuable. That's fantastic work because it, um, your documentary, I think, shows how important it is to hear other women's stories across the world. I was so impressed with the dedication and bravery of the women that you focused on. Can you tell me how you came to them and how you chose who to focus on? I was living in Karachi in 2018 when the first Earth March was conceived and it was a distillation from obviously global Me Too movement and then Time's Up and all these things that we were seeing. And I, I, there's, you know, lifelong activists and feminists who saw that there was an opportunity now with how prevalent social media and internet access has become in Pakistan the last few years to, to really do something more visible and to, to grow the feminist community. And they just happened to be my friends. I was making a film in Karachi and had uh, connected to like feminist comedians and writers and artists. And, and that led me to the activist community as well, which obviously intersects so much. And so, yeah, so I, I became involved in the march. I, I moved between Karachi and Islamba. So I suddenly knew activists and marchers and organizers in both cities. Um, and then, you know, it just the, the movement kept growing year by year from like three cities to seven cities to more. But the backlash and, and sort of the public conversation about what this movement was or who was behind it and a lot of paranoia about who was behind it also started cropping up. And then and then for me also, you know, as I was moving into another phase of my life, I realized I began to really think about the last couple of years I'd spent with these women and how much they meant to me and how much they meant to my growth as a human being. And, and, and I and it really solidified my intention to archive and witness these amazing people. There are inspiring moments in this film, but obviously also there's shocking moments about what these women are fighting for and also what they come up against. How would you summarise to someone who hasn't yet seen the film the real issues that these women are fighting for and protesting about? You know, the, the society globally that we're living in is based on hierarchy and hierarchy 
uh, whether it's economic or, or racial or otherwise, it often manifests or starts at home. And, and so really, I think the feminist fight or, or a leftist feminist fight is understood by women living anywhere. But in Pakistan, particularly because of the the the, the, the never-ending war on terror, there's this cultural idea that the, the empowerment of women, you know, that's very NGO speak, that that terminology is weaponized by the West in order to extend colonial violence and expansion, which is very true, right? We've seen um, sort of the uh, images of victimized Afghan women used to uh, justify a war. Uh, and so many NGOs have cropped up in the country and have been behind feminist intervention. And so those those lines become really blurry. And so for right-wing groups, it, it's hard to separate indigenous feminist resistance from what they see as another uh, arm of of the colonizer, of the violent colonizer. And so it becomes a very interesting and delicate position for feminists here to be able to speak about and to able to resist and, and push forward a, a new agenda for the way we imagine our lives when there's so many other forces to contend with. And unfortunately, because this region has been made so violent by local and external actors, that violence has become the preferred methodology to to stop anyone from saying what you don't like. Having watched these women coming together and fighting together I mean, I certainly felt a renewed conviction that sisterhood in activism is so important. Are there any particular scenes that encapsulated that for you when you were filming and ones that you thought, okay, this has to go in the film? There's so many that didn't go in the film that I wish (laughs) they could, you know, I wish the film could be longer because I think, you know, you have to sort of, when you're on the edit, you have to make, just make sure the story is moving and and, and all those uh, considerations. But there's so many moments of just humor, of like making fun of the dangers, right? Making fun of our positions um, that I loved. Um, and also there's, there's a character, uh, Rehan, uh, who in the film is titled Rashida, who, you know, I really see them coming into the space and finding their own power and strength. And I think that really encapsulates how these spaces are beneficial and nutritious and valuable in themselves right because there's, there's this pressure of like okay well what what impact have you made after like four years of marching the, the impact is us it's what you're f- re- saying you feel our own conviction and our own growth as human beings um, and the strength we can find in each other that's good enough what do you hope that people watching this as part of Sheffield Doc Fest will take away from the film I hope that it it, the film is able to connect to audiences who are organizing or who are hoping to find sisterhood or who are already within sisterhoods and, and, and see a reflection of themselves. I hope it helps uh, feminists to connect across borders. And yes, I, I do hope that there is a renewed conviction in this idea that there's always going to be struggle. I don't believe in a utopic end for humanity. I think you have to find yourself in this, you know, sick, sad world and still move with with hope and love. Are you still seeing a lot of your friends who are involved in the process? Are you all very tight? We see each other on Zoom now. I'm living in Islamabad, uh, in Rawalpindi, uh, actually outside of Islamabad. So it's, it's, it's hard to be so removed. But we're finding different ways of staying in touch. I'm writing a fiction series about about my time uh, with these women in Karachi, which takes another lens at sort of being sort of single urban feminist uh, in Pakistan at, in this day and age. So in a, in a way, I'm I'm 
through memory and, 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 and writing, I'm staying in touch. So when you say fiction series, do you mean uh, books or TV? It's, a, it's for a streamer, yeah, it's a TV Excellent. Sure. Well, I hope you come back on Girls on Film and tell us about that, because that sounds equally fascinating. Could I round up by asking you more about Sheffield Doc Fest and what it means to be part of a festival like that? Because personally, we we think documentaries are incredibly important, and I know you do too, but to have a, a whole festival dedicated to that, what does that mean to you? My, my film career has been buttressed and supported by documentary festivals, whether it's it's Hot Dogs or ITFA or Sheffield. And so I, I see Sheffield as part of the doc family and my family. And, and it's, it's very different, uh, you know, premiering during COVID when you're so far away and you don't get to connect to audiences. But the the cohort that Sheffield brings together is so beautiful. It's such an honor to be part of amazing films. And and also I love the streams that Sheffield has, right? Like I think the curation really is indicative of where the hearts uh, of the curators and the programmers lie. And I'm, I'm honored and proud to be part of that community. Nicely put. Oh, well, thanks so much for joining Girls on Film to talk about it. And we hope uh, people watch your very important film. And I do hope that you and yours are safe and well in these very strange times. Thank you, Anna. I hope you're safe too. And thank you so much for taking the time to view the film and speak to me. That was Anam Abbas. Sheffield Doc Fest runs till the 13th of June 2021. To book tickets, go to chefdocfest.com. That's S H E F F D O C F E S T dot com. If you're listening outside of the UK, so sorry, but you won't be able to access the films on that site. However, I do hope you've enjoyed the conversation and that you can find the docs in your territory soon. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Heather Archbold, audio producer Emma Butt, assistant producers Heather Dempsey and Eliana J, and our partners for this episode, Sheffield Docfest. You've been listening to me, Anna Smith, and I was joined by Cynthia Gill, Simran Hans and Anam Abbas. Thanks for listening. See you soon. I decided that it was not I that was wrong, but the society that was wrong. <laughs>